We just got finished making this epic costume with a bunch of amazing friends. There's so much creativity here and amazing craftsmanship. Let's dive in and take a look. The overall aesthetic for the design was done by our friend Albert. And then each person on the team took a different section to work through it. For example, like our friend Dan, he took on the shoulder and the arms. We knew that for this transforming robot, it needed to have moving arms that retract as it became a pterodactyl. So having that motion was critical. So he took on designing the gearing and all of the internal components. And it was pretty impressive because uh, Dan had to figure out the different gear ratios to get it to both rotate 60 degrees and translate a foot. So he did a, a combination of uh, two gears as well as a rack and pinion. Uh, and that mechanism was really cool. And then from that, we back drove the rest of the system. Once we established the arm movement, we could then back drive that into the wing movement. So, and, and Chin Lu took on the task of working on the wings. Yeah, for me, I knew clearly what I wanted the wings to do. It was a bifold behavior, but our overall group wanted to actually have it tuck away behind its back as well as swinging open. So having those two rotational behaviors, a pivot at the tip and a bend behind, meant that we really needed to gear and pull um, the actions separately. And Sal came up with this great idea of using a chain. You know, there's lots of different ways to transmit power across a distance. And so um, gears are something we use heavily. Um, and then of course belts would be something you could use or ropes. Um, but we went with this beaded chain because it's something that you see in window blinds all the time. You can pull on them and it, and it raises and lowers the blinds. And I thought that would be a perfect way to navigate the the power around corners and twists and turns. And to complement the whole gearing system, our friend Yun Li worked on the motor. She was able to combine the use of a stepper motor and an Arduino to control the amount of rotation, as well as timing and allowed us to be a lot more precise in the transformation phases. Yeah, and what was interesting to watch was the evolution of her journey because she had never driven a motor before with an Arduino. So she had a lot of learning to do. And it started out as just being able to turn the motor. And then of course I asked her, well, what if it turns too much? Will it break the whole system? So then we, we, uh, we added some limit switches. And so when the gearing uh, reaches the end and it hits the limit switch, the motor cuts out uh, and then it knows to go in the opposite direction. So it was a great evolution. She did a wonderful job. Uh, these big giant shins, they were all 3D printed because Adrian, uh, he said to us on our first meeting, he said that he loves 3D printing, he has one at home and he wants to be an engineer one day. So we leaned heavily into 3D printing and a big piece like this is hard to print on most printers because it's so big. So we took a lot of time breaking our bigger pieces into smaller pieces and Max on the team worked on this shin and he did a really great job at following the different contours to try and hide those seams as best as we could. Not only that, he was able to precisely model the inside where you don't really see it so that when it's printed it reduced the use of or eliminated the use of uh, supports so we were very conservative when it came to filament management which was great because so much was 3d printed even the beak was 3d printed it was designed by Albert and also 3d printed and sliced up by him and a lot of the elements around the beak was also 3D printed. For example, the four bar linkage that allows it to pivot from a collapsed form in the robot phase into the beak in the pterodactyl phase. We combined the use of 3D printing with EVA foam or L200 because there were certain areas that we knew needed to be a little bit more flexible and lightweight. So for example, at the tail end of the eyebrows that come off of the beak, needed to be somewhat flexible because it is a rather dangerous part of the build if if you're not careful it could be quite sharp if it was 3d printed we did the same thing with the uh, the spikes in fact our friend david worked on the spikes as well as many other things um, and these were made out of l200 uh, eighth inch rolled up and glued together um, so that way they were pointy but not dangerous pointy david of course is also our mega painter on the team and anytime you see a magnet uh, it has David's name written really? all over it. Um, in fact, uh, in many of our Magic Wheelchair builds, we try to use magnets to hold together pieces because it, they're just so great at very quickly locating and snapping things together and they register exactly where we want to time after time. Especially when it's not an area where it's under a lot of load. Um, we are always very cautious. These costumes often need to go outdoors and be wheeled around and 
undergo a lot of vibrations. So we wanna make sure that the magnets aren't in places where it could just shake off over time. Some other places where foam came into use uh, more appropriately than 3D printing was, for example, the helmet. Originally, we did 3D print this, but when all of us took turns putting the helmet on, it was just a little too much. So we pivoted and decided to build a version of it out of the EVA foam. Most of this is half inch. Um, some of it is a quarter inch, and I think we even used eighth inch to create all of the different detail in this. One tip on this cool design was when I was laser cutting these pieces to fold origami like back into a helmet. It actually looked better when we folded it inward. It created this really cool effect um, of almost like welded pieces of metal. That reminds me of uh, another spot that we used EVA foam and that is on the rocket boosters in the back. We used that same technique of laser cutting them first and then we built some custom wooden pieces that I ripped on the table saw at the correct angles and David used those to bevel all of the edges and glue them together. He then went back and actually used uh, a bit of caulking and kind of filled in the gaps and after the paint was all done and the weathering it kind of looked like gnarly weld beads, so, <laughs> so uh, it really really came out well on the costume. A useful tip is to first heat gun the surface of the L200 so that you seal up all of the pores. So when you then spray on a layer of plastic dip and then spray paint, it was able to look a little bit more smooth like a piece of metal. We then weathered it and it looked great. So the costume has uh, a little bit more going on in terms of uh, sounds. Uh, and so our friend Gabe worked on all the electronics to both have buttons on a dashboard that played interesting sounds, as well as a really cool voice changer that uh, Adrian can actually use to, to make himself sound like a robot. Adrian Frog. Some other elements that we added to make it more fun for Adrian is to include these little LED pucks. Everyone did something amazing for the build. And for those that didn't focus on fabricating, for example, Sarah focused a lot on the logistics of the reveal and working directly with the family. She was our liaison with um, Adrian's family. She was there all the time to make sure that everything was running on schedule. And she also pitched in when it came time to paint. But there's a lot of people behind the scenes that this costume wouldn't be what it is if they didn't step up and help in some way. Nice. <laughs> <laughs>